I'm Bhavna from the Infosys Science Foundation. I'm happy to welcome you all here this morning. And uh, we are hosting this lecture. The Infosys Science Foundation is hosting this lecture in association with uh, Sishugraha School. We're very happy to have them as our partners and very happy to see so many of you here. Uh, we've all romanticized zero and heard so many stories about it. It's high time we talk about other numbers. So um, that's what our speakers today, Professor Kare and Professor Ramesh Srikantan, are here to do. Good morning to all of you, and good morning to Professor Kare and Professor uh, Shikantan, and all the people from uh, the Shishigriha and my colleagues in uh, Infosys. You now it's my pleasure to be here to do justice to the two gentlemen. I know they have so much of accomplishment, but for want of time, I'm going to focus on few highlights of their accomplishments. And this magic of numbers as the, the series that we have here for promoting science is an important step. So mathematics, as we know, is a subject sometimes feared, but always revered. Is very important for our lives. Without it, we wouldn't have many modern uh, conveniences that you see here in the world, starting with uh, your mobiles, starting with your uh, transportation, starting with your uh, drugs that you need, starting with, you know, many things that are happening in the, in the current world and what is going to happen. So, for example, the entire IT world, if you look at the computers, you know, as an example, when you take, it is full of mathematics. So, without those mathematics, I don't know how we would have been you know, able to even think of computers. So as much uh, knowledge that this universe works is, you know, derived from, you know, about 50 years back, it would have all been done in mathematics as a foundation. Then the world discovers using that knowledge what it can do to serve the world. The government of India, fortunately for us, has declared this year as the year of mathematics. The Infosys Science Foundation, too, has focused its strategies in highlighting the beauty and importance of the subject, primarily through public lectures that, you know, that you are all going to see. Some have happened and some more are going to happen. The interactive sessions this morning is the first one we are hosting for school and college students in the hope that through Professor Kare who won the Infosys Prize in Mathematics in uh, 2010, and Professor Srikantan, you will discover the magic of numbers. Are you all keen on knowing the numbers? The two, two stalwarts in numbers are going to make it more interesting. I'm going to quickly end with the, their short introductions. Professor Chandrasekhar Kare is a professor of mathematics at the University of California. Los Angeles. In 2005, he made a major advance in the field of uh, Galileo representations and number theory by proving the level one Serre conjecture and later a proof of the full conjecture with Jo Pere Wittenberger. I hope I have been able to spell that correctly. And he did his undergraduate education at Trinity College, Cambridge University, finished his thesis in 1995 under the supervision of Harose Hida at UCLA and Dinakar Ramakrishnan at Caltech on number theory. He returned to India to work at the Tata Institute of uh, Fundamental Research, TIFR as we all know, in 2005. He moved to the United States, first to the University of Utah and to UCLA, where he is now Professor of Mathematics. He received the Fermat Prize in 2007, a Guggenheim uh, Fellowship in 2008, and the Infosys Prize in Mathematics in 2010. This year he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society of London. It's a very prestigious society and uh, please welcome him, you know, with that introduction. 
I was just asking uh, Professor Kare, you know, what is it that you made you take up this? And you know what his answer was? His answer was there was a gentleman, a scientist in his, uh, when he heard him in the ninth grade about, you know, how mathematics is beautiful, particularly the numbers and how interesting these numbers are and how it can solve the practical problems of the society. You know, when he was in ninth grade, that really enthused him to take up mathematics and that he has become an expert in that in his own way. Now, let me come to the other gentleman, another very accomplished uh, scientist, Professor Ramesh Srikantan, works primarily in the area of arithmetic algebraic geometry, in particular, in particular the theory, algebraic cycles and special values of L functions. Don't ask me any questions on that, but I'm just introducing. I won't be able to tell you what they are. They're so accomplished. Trying to establish what are usually called the blow Caro or Bellinos Bloch conjectures. I hope I've been able to spell that correctly. He received his BSc from St. Xavier's uh, College, Bom Bombay, and which is where John Abraham also came out. And uh, then a PhD from the University of Chicago. After that, he did some postdoctoral work in the Institute of Advanced Study, Duke University, TIFR, and University of uh, Toronto. He then joined TIFR Bombay in 2004, but moved to Bangalore shortly thereafter, and finally joined Indian Statistical Institute, Bangalore in 2009, which is based in Bangalore. Again, I asked him, welcome him uh, once again with a, a clap of your hands, please. I'm sure both of these uh, scientists will keep this workshop very interesting, a lot more interesting than what I have spoken to you so far. I don't want to take up any more time. Again, I asked Srikantan, what made you choose this area? And his, his answer was, uh, you know, he knew he was good in numbers and he wanted to become an expert in numbers and that's what enthused him to become where he is today, the number specialist and number scientist. Thank you very much to both of you and welcome all of you. Thank you, Mr. Dinesh. Uh, I just wanted to uh, lay out a couple of house rules. If you have mobiles, anybody do switch them off or put them on silent. Um, we'll split this talk into two. We'll have uh, Professor Ramesh Srikantan talking first and then Professor Kare. If you have questions, the professors are happy to take them in between their sessions as well. If you think there's a relevant question to a point that's being made, please just raise your hand and one of our volunteers in two aisles will come to you with a mic. When you raise your hand, just introduce yourself and your school as well. So without further ado, uh, Professor Srikantan, please. What I am going to talk about today is uh, something maybe most of you have seen at some point in your life, which is prime numbers. Maybe in your school uh, work, I guess you're taught something about it. So I thought uh, I would uh, speak a little bit about it and maybe tell you some things maybe which you did not know. Oh. So, uh, yeah, by the way, feel free to ask me any questions at any point and just raise your hand and if I see it, I'll uh, answer. Uh, I'll try to ask. So prime numbers are the numbers 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, and so on and so forth, okay? And by definition, they are the natural numbers which cannot be divided by any other positive number apart from themselves and, and one, of course, right? So why are they important? Because they're in some sense the building blocks of numbers, okay? In the following sense, all natural numbers are constructed out of them. Okay. If, so if you understand the prime numbers, you will understand a lot of things about numbers in general. In some ways, they're sort of the, the bricks under which you build the house of numbers or something like that. And if you know the bricks, then you can build a house. Okay, so this is a small picture of the prime numbers, uh, some of them, at least 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, and so on up to 97, which is also a prime number. So, as I said, they're the alphabet which make up the numbers. But unlike the English alphabet, which is, you know, 
made of the letters A, B, C, and D, and so on and so forth. Uh, every word is a very precisely one spelling. For example, in English, the word for this event would be either program, P-R-O-G-R-A-M-M-E, or program, P-R-O-G-R-A-M, depending on which part of the world you're in or whether you chose English UK or English USA on your spell checker, right? So such things don't happen with prime numbers, okay? There is a beautiful theorem which is due to Euclid. Euclid was this Greek mathematician of uh, 2,000 years ago, okay? Uh, here he is, uh, the, the guy trying to figure out how to use an iPad um, with his uh, students trying to uh, show him, I suppose, okay? Uh, so most of you must be aware of it at some level of this theorem of Euclid's, but you may not know it explicitly. I mean, implicitly you might be aware of it. So it's, you know, much of what you do in school depends on this particular theorem, which is, you know, if you do long division or multiplication or HCF or LCM. So what is the theorem? The theorem is what's called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. It says that any positive integer greater than one can be uniquely written as a product of prime numbers. Okay, for example, 10 is two times five. It's not three times something else. I mean, it's an important fact that you, you know, which you sort of, you know that, you, you know, in school you do such things all the time, but you may not know it stated in this explicit form. Or three, five, one, nine is 17 times 23 times three squared. Now, of course, 10, you can say it's not three times something, but can you say three, five, one, nine is not nine, uh, 11 times something, or, you know, you don't know, right? So it's not immediately clear that every number can be written uniquely as a product of prime numbers, but it's true. Uh, or an even more complicated example is this, 42949672897 is 641 times 67004417. Okay? So any number can be written as a product of powers of prime numbers. This is uh, Euclid's uh, theorem of 2000 years ago, and it's very, very, very important in some ways, or fundamental, let's just say. Okay? So Euclid's theorem in some sense says that there's precisely one way to spell a number using the alphabet of primes. Okay, there's no ambiguity allowed in the whole uh, uh, thing, right. Of course, now you might say, okay, 10 is also minus two times minus five. And that's fine, you know, the point is, but I said a prime number is a positive integer, so these things are taken care of by that. But there's a little bit of, you know, as you study a little more about this, you have to worry about keeping things like, the minuses in the right way, but I won't say anything more about that, okay? So while Euclid's proof, uh, the proof of this theorem is not so difficult, in practice it's not so easy to factor a number into its prime factors. See, for example, if you take some number like 727, right? You don't know if it's a prime number, and I don't know how easy it'll be for you to sort of factorize it into prime numbers. Uh, I wouldn't know how to do it sitting here, and I wouldn't even try, but, uh, it's not so easy, right? And in fact, this, the fact that it's not so easy to factor a number into prime numbers or prime factors is exploited in encryption called RSA algorithm or in public key cryptography. So they use the fact that if P and Q are two large prime numbers and N is P times Q, right? Um, if you make N public and you don't know P and Q, it's very hard to find out what P and Q are. But if you know P, you would know Q. And if you know Q, you would know P, so somehow you can sort of transmit data using that. It takes a long time to factor N, okay? And on the other hand, if you know P or Q, it's quite easy to factor N, right? Because you know N is P times Q, and so if you knew, for example, in the earlier slide, I had this big 10-digit number, and it was a product of two prime numbers. Now, if I just gave you the 10-digit number, there's no way you would know that it's a product of two numbers or two prime numbers or whatever it is. It would take you a long time to figure out what the prime factors are, but but if you knew one of the prime factors, you could immediately get the other one by dividing, right? So the next time you use your credit card number on the internet, you should thank Euclid for saving it from being stolen. I mean, so this is, the point I want to make here is that somehow things which you uh, do in everyday life, like maybe not all of you use credit cards on the internet maybe, but maybe your parents do, but those things also use uh, ideas coming from what Euclid did 2,000 years ago, which is, you know, something quite remarkable, right? That, I mean, how many other things are being, how many other 2,000-year-old ideas are being uh, still used, right? Okay? So mathematics has this sort of long-term applicability because it's a fact of nature at some level, and so it's all used all the time, and you can't, you can't it doesn't change. 
Okay, so one might wonder, we know there are 26 letters in the English alphabet, right? How many prime numbers are there, right? Okay, so does anybody have an idea? Okay, yeah, so every once in a while there's a newspaper heading sitting, largest prime number found, right? So if you read the article more carefully and uh, if the newspaper is, uh, well, uh, decent, I mean like, for example, not the Times of India, okay, then they talk about the largest known prime number, okay? So Euclid, again, uh, proved there are infinitely many prime numbers, okay? And the proof is not, again, once again, not difficult. I mean, as you can never say something which is proved 2,000 years ago cannot be too difficult because they didn't know much mathematics in those days. But, so I thought I'll discuss it here because it's something which uh, can be told to high school students. So this theorem of Euclid, which says there are infinitely my, many prime numbers in Z. Z is a set of integers, which is the set of, uh, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, and then also minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. But, you know, in some ways you can just consider 0, 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, 3 up to infinity and so on. I think Shaker will talk a little more about that. So Z is just notation for that set. Okay, so suppose there were only finitely many prime numbers. Okay, say R of them are there. So suppose, you know, say R was some 50 or 100 or something, right? And let S be the set of all prime numbers. So just P1, P2, PR are all the prime numbers, right? Okay, now I want to prove there are infinitely many prime numbers. So I want to sort of show that this R cannot be finite, right? So you consider some number, which is, you take the product of all these numbers, P1 times P2 times P3 times up to PR, and then you add one. So for example, I mean, our set would be like 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, and so on and so forth. You take the product of all those numbers, and then you add 1, okay? Because you're assuming they're only finitely many, so you can take this, this makes sense as a number. You can take a product of finitely many numbers, right? Okay? Then, of course, just by observing, you can see that P1 doesn't divide n, because P1 divides the first term. It doesn't divide this, the 1, right? Okay? So when you divide by 1, uh, divide by P1, there'll be residue, there'll be a remainder of 1. Right? Okay? Similarly, P2 also doesn't divide N. And P3 and so on, all these numbers up to PR, none of them will divide N, just by the same reasoning. Right? Okay? So N is not divisible by any element in the set S. Okay? So what does that mean? I mean, what is a prime number? Prime number is a number which is not divisible by any other number except for itself. Okay? So, it means that either n is a prime number, because it's not due by any of these numbers, or it's due by some prime number p, which is not in S, right? Because you have a set and you found something which is not due by any of these guys, but then it's, it's either a prime number or it's not, it's due by some other prime number which is not in the set S, okay? And so, well, so in either case, there is some prime number p which is not in the set S. So, this contradicts the assumption that S is the set of all prime numbers. We assume that this is all the prime numbers, and then you're constructed one more guy who's not in that set. So uh, when you do that, I mean, so that shows that, you know, okay, you say there are 50 of them, and then you find a 51st guy. So, and then maybe you can include that guy, but then you can find a 52nd guy, and so on and so forth. So there's no end to what you can do. So there have to be infinitely many primes. You can't have finitely many primes, okay? So then you can ask, okay, well, um, you know, we know there are infinitely many primes, so the, the, the task of trying to find a larger and larger prime is sort of an exercise in futility. You keep, you keep doing it, and then you, you know that there are infinitely many, so there's always one guy bigger, but you may still ask, what is the largest known prime, right, at this time, in some ways? So you know that maybe uh, 691 is a prime, and that's quite a large number, but maybe there are certainly larger numbers. I, uh, I don't think I go give an example so far, but, but uh, right? Yeah, I mean... If you think about it, you can come up with a bigger number. So there is no known formula for prime numbers. In other words, there is no known increasing function f, so that f of n is prime number for some infinite set. If you had that, then you could just keep generating larger and larger prime numbers, right? So it's not so easy to find larger and larger primes, okay? The French, there's a French monk and mathematician, so all these guys that, you know, three, four hundred years ago, most of them who did uh, mathematics or science were sort of monks or something else and the science or mathematics was sort of an alternative career as a, you know, because it wasn't really uh, established as a field in itself, I guess. Uh, there weren't uh, 
university, well, there were universities, but maybe they didn't teach uh, mathematics so much. They probably taught more theology and philosophy and so on and so forth. So this, this guy, Mersenne, thought he had a formula, okay? Uh, he thought the numbers of the form, uh, you know, two to the power p minus one, where p is a prime number, are prime numbers, okay? He thought this, this rather um, uh, simple way of generating more prime numbers. For example, right? Two squared is, uh, so two is a prime, so two squared minus one is four minus one, which is three, right? Okay? You take three, you get two cubed minus one, so that's eight minus one, which is seven, right? Two to the five minus one is uh, 32 minus one, which is 31, okay, and so on and so forth. These numbers are called Mersenne numbers, and you know, he did a few calculations like this and said, okay, yeah, there must be prime numbers, okay? And that would give you a very easy way because, you know, you could always find some large prime number, then take two to the, that prime number and get some even larger number and subtract one, and that's going to be a larger prime number according to this Mersenne's ideas, okay? This would give a very pretty easy way of generating larger, larger prime numbers, right? Unfortunately, it's not true. For example, uh, two to the 11 minus one is 2047, which is 23 times 89. So it breaks down at that point, at 11, right? I think you can go seven is, uh, well, okay, I can't do that calculation. Uh, two, fifth, two to the seven is what? Two to the seven is uh, five, six. Five is 32, so six is 64, so 120. I think 127 is a prime number, right? Um, yeah, so maybe you can check that. And that's, after that, 11, 11 is the next guy, and 11 fails, okay? But this is still a pretty good way of finding prime numbers. And in fact, the largest prime numbers are found this way. So there's something called the Great Internet Mersenne Prime Search, GIMPs, which tries to use, you know, basically distributed computing to try and check if larger and larger Mersenne numbers are primes. So distributed computing is something like, you know, you just spread the, the search over lots of small computers instead of using one supercomputer to do the calculation. And so in fact, if you have a computer at home and you want to uh, help them find a larger and larger prime, you can give them uh, your computer time. In other words, you hook up your, you go to the internet, go to some website, download some software, and when you're, when you're not using your computer and your computer is on, it'll sort of use your computer for, for uh, uh, doing some work, okay? So right now, the largest known Mersenne prime, num prime number is a Mersenne prime, which is the number M43112609, so it's 43,112,609, uh, I mean, so it's two to that power minus one, okay? So that 43 million guy is also quite a big number. It is a prime number, I, I guess. Yeah, it has to be a prime number. So this is an even huge bigger number, right? Okay, it's a very big number. So this is discovered in 2008, and it has 12,978, no, 12,978,189 digits. So that's a pretty big number, okay? So to get an idea of how big this number is, well, if you use a word processor with 50 lines per page and 75 digits per line, this is standard A4 paper, this would require 3,461 pages to display it. Or if, you're, if you were to print it out using standard printer paper, single-sided, it would require approximately seven reams of paper. Okay, so you know, that's more than the number of people in this audience, okay? Or if you write as a single number with three digits per centimeter, which is a normal way of writing digits, it will stretch for 32 kilometers. So most of you could, you know, it'll take you, you could, from your house to here would probably take that much. Okay. So another way of getting primes are the so-called Fermat numbers. So Fermat was this other famous uh, uh, French, uh, well, mathematician, and I think he was a lawyer, okay, who famously conjectured what's called Fermat's last theorem. But one of the other things, which is maybe not so his, not so well-known theorem, because it's not a theorem, is that if you consider numbers two to the two to the n plus one, right, okay, then these are also supposed to be prime. He thought they might be prime. So for example, f of zero is two to the two to the zero, which plus one, which is three. f of one is uh, two squared plus one, so that's five, right? f two is two, two to the uh, two to the two, two to the four plus one, which is 16 plus one, which is 17, right? So these are three prime numbers you can get. But these two are not always prime, okay? And as an exercise, you can try to find the first one which is not a prime number. And I'll give you a hint. It has already appeared in this uh, talk so far, okay? So it may not be so easy, but I can give you a hint by saying it has appeared here, okay? 
Now, as a more, maybe a further exercise, but it's not so uh, difficult, actually. I mean, but you can think about these. Is you can try to show that, you know, Mersenne primes were 2 to the p minus 1, where p was a prime number. If you take a number that went 2 to the n minus 1, where n is not a prime number, then you should be able to show that it's, it's not a prime number. So, for example, 2 to the 4 minus 1, right? It's uh, 15, right? 2 to the 4 minus 1 is 16 minus 1 is 15, and that's not a prime number, right? Or 2 to the 6 minus 1 is uh, 63, I guess, right? So that's not a prime number. But 2 to the p minus 1 seems to be a prime number. So you have to show that, well, you can always find a factor of 2 to the n minus 1 if n is not a prime number, OK? And another way is, you know, these Fermat numbers are 2 to the, 2 to the n plus 1. So you should be able to show that 2 to the n plus 1 is not a prime number if n is not a power of 2. Okay, so for example, 2 cubed plus 1 is not a prime, minister, prime number. 2 cubed is what? 8 plus 1, 9, right? So it's not a prime number. Okay, and 2 to the, what's the next? Not a power. 2 to the 5. 5 is not a power of 2, right? So 2 to the 5 plus 1 is uh, 33, right? 33 is not a prime number. It's 11 times 3, I guess. Right? So in some sense, 2 to the n, 2 to the p minus 1 is a good way of, I mean, so the only hope for prime numbers is of this type of the Mersenne and Fra-Fermat numbers. I mean, you can't hope to find primes in this way using other numbers. You can't take 2 to the n minus 1 where n is a not a prime number and 2 to the n plus 1 if n is not a power of 2. Okay? All right. So, in fact, there are very few known Fermat primes. Okay? Uh, as I said, uh, there is a counterexample in, uh, in this talk itself. I leave it to you. A number, a Fermat number, which is not a prime. Okay. So one might wonder, okay, how are the prime numbers distributed among the natural numbers? You know, you have the numbers two, three, five, seven, and so on and so forth, right? Okay. So the well-known, there's an American-German mathematician called Don Zagier. He said, primes grow like weeds among the natural numbers, seeming to obey no other law than that of chance. But they also exhibit stunning regularity, and there are laws governing their behavior, and they, that they obey these laws with almost military precision. So it's a bit funny. They look like they're completely, you know, you have a few numbers. We had a picture of the first uh, few number, prime numbers. It's not clear how you get the next ones and so on and so forth. It seems to be completely sort of random, a chance, chancy, okay? But there are certain laws. If you look from the right point of view, they do obey some nice laws. And I mean, I guess it's with anything. I mean, if you look at the graph from a, if you take a graph of something, you might have a linear graph. If you look at, if you plot the right x against the right y, but you plot the right x against the wrong y, you might get something which looks completely different. So you look for the right laws in some ways. So from Euclid's theorem, we know that there are infinitely many prime numbers, right? But one can ask, what fraction of the numbers are prime, right? That's a fairly valid question, right? You have, you know, well, let's see, right? I mean. Maybe you look at the first 100 numbers and you ask how many of them are prime. I mean, we had a list there, right? So, so if you define pi x to be the number of primes less than or equal to x, right? And so the fraction of primes is pi x by x, right? Okay? Okay? So then, uh, for example, pi of 1 is 0, okay? Pi of 2 is 1 because there's only one prime less than or equal to 2. Pi of 3 is 2, right? Because there's 2 and 3 are the two primes, okay? Um, pi of 100 is 25. Okay, why is it 25? Well, if you saw the picture on the first page, I had the first, the prime less than 100, and it was a 5 by 5 box, so that's how I know it's 25. Okay, if I show you that picture again, but, um, okay. So one might wonder, what does this function look like? What does pi x look like as x becomes larger and larger? Is there some structure to this? Okay, so the great uh, German mathematician uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss, whom uh, some of you might have heard of because he's uh, well known for I mean, he's sort of an all-round genius who did lots of things from number theory to astronomy to physics and so on. I don't know uh, whether you guys have maybe, uh, yeah, I'm not sure, but magnetism and then things like the, he spent a lot, unfortunately, or maybe not unfortunately, unfortunately, he spent his, uh, the, a big chunk of his career from the age of 20 to 40 essentially trying to compute the, the orbit of an asteroid. And, uh, well, you know, of course, he spent a lot of time making observations, taking calculations, and so on and so forth. And 
while at some level it was a waste of time because by that, by the age of 21, he had also done some remarkable things in number theory uh, and written a book. Uh, but uh, he spent much of his youth, or his, what you would say, his most creative years doing this kind of stuff. And, um, but he actually, while doing that, he invented a lot of other things which were useful later on. So, so he conjectured something about the structure of this uh, function. He said that when he was only 15 or 16, this is the remarkable thing we conjectured, that the function pi x behaves as follows. Pi x is asymptotically like x over log to natural log of x. Okay? Or in other words, pi x by x behaves like 1 over log x. Okay? So log, the base e is the natural log function. I don't know if you have come across it as yet in school, but you all know the common logarithm. And natural logarithm is sort of a, a variation of that. Okay? And the tilde means that as x gets larger, this is a better and better approximation. Okay? And there's, if some of you know the integral, some integral calculus, there's something called the logarithmic integral function, okay? Lix, which is the integral from 2 to e of dt by log t. Okay? So in school, you never really do this because it's, you can't evaluate this integral explicitly. In the, I mean, you can integrate integral dt by t, right? You get log, but dt by log t is a little more complicated. <clears throat> but you can do it by pass or whatever. You get some sort of expansion like this, x over log, log e x plus x over log e x squared and so on and so forth. Okay? And uh, this turns out to be a better approximation. So if you compare the three functions, right? You have pi x, you have x over log x, and you have logarithmic integral of x. This is the graph you get. Um, so the green line is x over log x. The red line is pi x, and the blue line is li x. So it looks like a purple line, but actually it's a blue line and a and a red line close to each other, okay? And you see how remarkably close it, they are. I mean, so somehow the structure of these prime numbers, you know, and the log function, the natural log function is one of the most uh, fundamental functions in nature in some ways, right? So it's kind of nice also the fact that this distribution of prime numbers is intimately connected with some other function which is very natural. I mean, um, that's interesting and remarkable and maybe not so surprising at some level, but so, um, so how close the functions pi x and log x get? So these statements were proved, uh, so Gauss conjectured them in 1796 or so, right? When he was about 19 or 20, he wrote this in some book or some paper, okay? And uh, they were proved in 1896 by uh, French mathematicians Hadamard and de la vallee -Pousset. They proved them independently though, and you know, what they used to prove it is much, much more complicated. They used rather, uh, different things coming from complex analysis, and it was quite a uh, different, uh, I mean, it seemed like completely unrelated, because number theory is something about prime numbers, very explicit, you know, uh, things, and somehow that seems to uh, lead you to other things. So I just thought I would end by some unsolved problems for you guys to try at home. Uh, there are quite a few, a lot of problems in theory of prime numbers that are easy to state and understand, but have so far evaded proof. Okay, so here are a few. So one question is, are there infinitely many Mersenne primes? So Mersenne primes are two to the p minus one. So, I mean, of course, if you knew there were infinitely many primes, that would give you a nice way of getting more and more larger Mersenne primes. But, you know, maybe you want to prove it without actually uh, constructing things. So if you could prove it without constructing it, then you would have a really good way of getting, you'll have a function which gives you larger and larger prime numbers as you go up. Okay. Then there are something like twin prime conjecture, which is, are there infinitely many prime pieces that p and p plus 2 are both prime? So you're going to 3 and 5, 5 and 7, 11 and 13, 17 and 19, okay? Then maybe you have to go a little higher, 29 and 31, maybe? Yeah, so on and so forth. So whether there are infinitely many such twin, twin prime pairs, okay? I, this again is not known. It's called a twin prime conjecture. Okay. And there's another one which is a rather interesting conjecture called the Goldbach conjecture. Can every even number greater than two be written as a sum of two prime numbers? So it's a pretty remarkable statement because most statements about prime numbers are about products. You say, you know, Euclid's theorem says any number can be written uniquely as a product of prime numbers. But here you're saying, can every even number be written as a sum of two prime numbers? So for example, uh, let's take some even number. Let's take 12. 12 is 7 plus 5, right? Okay? Or let's take some other even number. Let's 15, 16. 16 is, uh, 
11 plus 5. Yeah, so, so far it's working. We haven't found context examples. Okay. And more generally, can every integer greater than 5 be written as sum of three prime numbers? Right? There's a conjecture. Okay. So the Goldbach conjectures have been verified for numbers up to 4 times 10 to the power of 18. So, I mean, we wouldn't have been able to find a counter example so easily. But uh, uh, that's not enough. You see, for mathematicians, they, this is not, you know, just checking that it's true for some large and large and large numbers or up to some, some point. I mean, maybe it will satisfy some people, but, you know, it's not enough to satisfy some of these, uh, some mathematicians, I guess. And they, they sort of, they, they, yeah, I mean, they want, it's not, you know, somehow it's not enough for almost every, they want every. Okay, they're too greedy. Okay. So if you want to become famous, and maybe, you know, by the larger Infosys, you can become rich as well, you can try to answer some of these questions. But, you know, I can assure you they're not so easy. And so you're better, perhaps you, better you focus on your schoolwork for the time being. So I'd like to thank Wikipedia for all the pictures used in this presentation because, uh, yeah. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me. Um, at rameshrikar at gmail.com. I also want to say something. So I, I work at ISI, which is uh, the Indian Statistical Institute, which is, has a B math program. And I would say, I mean, maybe arguably it's the best math program in this country. So if you want to study mathematics as an undergraduate degree, rather focused mathematics thing, it has its pros and cons. I mean, you learn a lot, but, but maybe at the end of the day, you, you're too much of a, you don't have a, a very broad an education, but you learn a lot of mathematics. I would encourage you to sort of consider it. I mean, you have to sort of do some, uh, the process is a bit, you do some sort of test and then they call you for further interviews. But ISI is in Bangalore, so it's sort of, you know, I think we don't get enough students from Bangalore. Most of the people come from Calcutta so, uh, or Bengal. So I would recommend that you, uh, you know, think about it if you, if you want. You'll also get paid money for it. Yeah, so that's one of the things. You know, you get paid, you get money paid for your undergraduate education, which is quite something, okay? So, and if you want to contribute computer time to the great internet Mersen Prime Search, you can go to www.mersen.org. Okay, right, so thank you. Oh, good morning, sir. I'm Abhay, Abhay Rangan from Pona Prani Education Center. I just have a question uh, about the theory I just came up now for finding out uh, prime numbers. Can you please help me prove it or disprove it? Um, is that uh, given that n is an odd number except 1, n square minus 2 will give a prime number. So can you please, uh, I just uh, have some work examples. Try a few examples more examples, it will certainly fail quite fast. n squared minus 2. Yes. Right? Uh, given that so n is an odd squared, number. No, 6 squared, 6 squared minus 2 is certainly not a prime number. Uh, given that n is odd, an odd, odd number. Odd, okay, 7 squared minus 2 is 40. Okay, it's working. Eight, 9 squared, 9 squared, 79, is it a prime number? Okay. Uh, I have no and idea. Then, okay, just keep going up a little bit more. Let's see. Uh, uh, well, I have uh, done till uh, 13 square. So and it seems to be working so far. 223, is it a prime number? Oh, maybe it is. Ah, one. 119. Ah, so yeah, there you have an example. So Yeah, I mean, it's, these things will not work, I can assure you. Uh, it's not so easy. Uh, you just have to try. I mean, it's not bad to try, but of course, yeah, it seems like it will work for the first few small numbers. And there are some nice, actually, reasons why they work also. You should, uh, there's a nice theory why why these things work and why they fail also. There are some, uh, I don't exactly remember, but you can get some amount of polynomials to give you prime numbers for some values, and then they'll stop giving you prime numbers after some point. If it was so easy, it would be, yeah, it would be... And nice, but yes. unfortunately, it's not so easy. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, sure. My name is Pritam from National Public School, HSR. So, using the formula that tells you that there are infinite prime numbers, um, you can say that the um, p, if there are r prime numbers, then p r plus one is equal to p of one into p of two all the way to p of r plus one. Mm. So. Um, no, one isn't saying that. No, be careful. I didn't say that. I said that that number is either a prime or is divisible by some prime which is not in this set. So there's no guarantee that the r plus first prime is p1 to pr plus 1. You see, that's not necessarily a prime. For example, I think you just start with uh, 2 times 3 is 6 plus. Okay, that's what it's 2 times 3 is. Uh, it, it'll fail pretty fast. I mean, what it is, is it's not, a, it's, it, it's not divisible by a prime in that set. 
but it's, it's divisible by a prime from outside. It need not be a prime in itself. I mean, that n number which I wrote, p1, p2, p up to pr plus 1, that number need not be a prime number. But it is divisible by a prime number which is not among the p1 to prs. That's all you can say. So if, yeah, if that was what you were getting at, you were trying to say that that's the next prime number. That's not true. For example, let's say 2, 3, uh, 2 times 3 times 5 is how much? Um, that works. You see, these things sort of work for small numbers, but they stop working quite fast if you, if you can uh, calculate a little faster than, uh, yeah, or if you, uh, 2 times 3 times 5 times 7, uh, it'll, it'll fail pretty soon, I can assure you. Yeah, let's go to 2 times 3 times 5 times 7. It's, uh, 2 times 3 is 6 times 5 is 30 times 7 is 210 plus 1. 211, is it a prime? I don't know. So try to see if 211 is a prime or whether it's divisible by some number which is not a prime. Number. So you're saying that if you take the largest prime number and the uh, second largest prime number, subtract one from the second largest prime number and add one to the product of those two numbers, then you will not get a prime number. No, I'm not saying anything either yes or no. I'm saying there's no guarantee that it is a prime number. Whatever your construction you were suggesting, I'm not saying that it's not a prime number. I'm saying it's not guaranteed that it is a prime number. That's all. But okay. it is given by some prime number which is not in this set. That's all. Thank you. Uh, I'm Malni uh, Rao from Shishigraha School. Uh, you said prime numbers follow military-like precision. So isn't there some kind of a, a sequence which they follow, like um, add one or No, no, add so that's the thing. I mean, I, I didn't say that first. It was Zagir who said that. But, uh, just, but the point was, it's not... So in, when I say military-like precision, or when he says military-like precision, what he means is it sort of obeys some sort of structure. There is some structure to it. Okay, there's some, this thing. It may not be as, see, as I said, there's no known formula which gives you larger and larger prime numbers. If they were, it would be quite easy to generate larger and larger prime numbers, right? Okay, so you can't say what the next prime number is in some ways. But you can sort of say that, maybe roughly you can say it lies in this region, or maybe something like that. So they don't follow any particular order? There's no direct, when you say, what do you mean by order, right? So you can, you know, in some ways, even Bangalore traffic ob obeys some sort of rules, okay? okay? So when you look from the right point of view, you'll see, if you look at a Google map picture, you'll see at least most people are, yeah, it's like Bangalore traffic. I mean, I think that's the best example. Most people go on the right way on the right side of the road, on the, you know, the correct way on the side. But there are always exceptions. So you can't predict whether the next guy is going to be on that side of the road, you know, something like that. Maybe that's not the right analogy, but something like that. You see, there's no... There is a, in the large you might see some structure. If you look from above, maybe you might see that more or less there is some structure. But when you look at, you can't say where the next thing. Oh yeah, if you look at a map of Bangalore, it's from above. It looks like there is, you know, a proper grid, then it's a, it looks like the, you know, there is some sort of uh, regularity to the whole thing. But you look, when you're on the streets, it's completely chaotic, so you can't say. So it's something similar to that, maybe. If you look at it from some point of view, there is some structure, but you can't. I don't know, maybe I, I'm just too obsessed with Bangalore's problems, but yeah, that's it. Thank you. I'm Subramanian from DPS South. Um, I just, to generate more primes, right, so you gave in the proof of the infinitude of primes, right, you said, so if we consider the set of known primes, yeah. like all the set of known primes, take their product, like all the set of known primes, take their product and then add one. Yeah. Wouldn't that be prime? No, that would tell you that, that would give you a prime which is not in that set of known primes, so right? But you don't know which prime, I mean, no, that's not prime, but that's divisible by a prime which is not in this set. But we've considered the set as all the known primes. Right, right, so take, but, yeah, but then how do you find it, right? Okay, so that's the way, yeah, you can do that. Take the set of all known primes, you multiply them out, add one, then you know, theoretically from Euclid's theorem, that there is one more prime, but how do you find it? I mean, isn't... That number need not be a prime. That number is divisible by a prime which is not in this set of known primes. So, so you know there is a prime which is unknown, or you know there is an, at least one prime which is not in your set of known primes, but you don't know what that prime number is. You see? Right? So, so the, the result that we get that the, the product of all the elements of the set plus one is either a prime in itself or it is divisible by exactly. some external prime. Yeah, but it's not a, it's not a constructive result. You can't construct that next prime. Okay. You see? Yes. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, okay. Thanks. Thank you. We'll have time for more questions after Professor Kare talks to us. So Ramesh uh, has given a very nice talk on numbers, a tough act to follow. Uh, 
So as the number, as Ramesh has proved one theorem during his talk, that number theorists cannot calculate, right? So, so I think that's often number theory is, it's not about calculating numbers fast. I, the standard joke about number theorists is, three number theorists go to a restaurant, they have a hearty meal, and at the end of the meal, the, the waiter comes with a check, and then now each has to figure out, they probably, they don't want to pay, no one wants to pay for all of the others, so everyone wants to pay their own share, and then they try to figure out who owes what, right? And number theorists often struggle, the waiter has to help them. So often, so number theory, being interested in, num, in being a number theorist may not mean that you're very good with calculating with numbers, it's maybe you're good with thinking about numbers. Of course, there are spectacular exceptions to this, like uh, Srinivas Ramanujan, whose 125th uh, birth anniversary we are celebrating. Uh, on that occasion, this is supposed to be the National Year of Mathematics, which Infosys also is, uh, has been celebrating with an event, I think, a couple of months ago. So I've met with some of you over here. So uh, again, Infosys is doing a great job of uh, sort of uh, try to inspiring young people to be drawn to science. Uh, all right, so uh, I'd like to, and in fact, I'm gonna begin with, uh, before my actual talk, I wanna begin with, my, with the story of how I got into mathematics. So as a student, I was just about average in mathematics. I was not very good or anything. But what happened was that in the, in the ninth grade, I was studying in a school in Bombay. Uh, some, uh, somebody, uh, my father brought home a mathematician. For some reason or the other, he had come to meet him in his office. My father's an accountant anyway. So he brought, he brought this mathematician home and he seemed a very fascinating figure. So he just talked to me about some, a few very simple things. So, so, so some of the students who are uh, getting bored with the rest of the talk, they can try to solve the following problem. So yeah, the problem he posed to me was, suppose you're given, say, numbers like 11 and 131, right? And suppose you're asked to find numbers such that when you find a number such, when you, such that when you divide it by 11, it leaves a remainder of 2. Yeah, and when, when you divide it by 131, it leaves a remainder of 15. Find all such numbers. So very basic problem. It, it's a comprehensible to sorry, anyone in the second, third grade, right? I mean, whatever, once you learn division. So you want, you want a number so that when you divide by 11, I've, I've just made up these figures, so hopefully I'm, I'll say the same thing. So you want, you want a number which when divided by 11 leaves a remainder of two, and when divided by 131 leaves a remainder of 15, right? So if anyone finds the solution, please come and see either Ramesh or me after the talk. Because I think it's a, it's a difficult problem to solve, though it seems very simple to find the kind of the idea of, which leads to the solution is one of the important ideas in number theory. So, okay, so, the, so what happened was this, this person came to my house and uh, told me about these things, and I got very fascinated, right? And, uh, and kind of I, it, it became, I, I decided that this is what I wanted to do, in spite of not being very good at it in school. So the, kind of in some sense, the, what, diff, drove, what attracted me to the subject was, the kind of, there's a, thinking about numbers, they're very natural things. We know about them since nursery school. Right, so kind of they are very tangible kind of things, but there's still so many mysteries about them. This example, uh, which this mathematician told me about, it's called uh, the Chinese remainder theorem. Again, known to people, the Chinese 2,000 years ago or more. So uh, that was uh, so there was kind of very simple facts about numbers which you can think about and which are still very puzzling. So what drove, uh, what attracted me to the subject was the beauty of the subject plus the fact that it was difficult. Right, so somehow that was a combination of this kind of the glamour was that of difficulty and of beauty. So that's what kind of. Uh, drove me into, brought me into mathematics. So I think these such events where, uh, which are organized where kind of students in high school are exposed to uh, facts about mathematics or stuff about mathematics which is not taught typically in textbooks or in schools, is it's kind of interesting because there'll be a few of you hopefully who at the end of such an event will kind of be, feel like thinking more about mathematics and go on to pursue a career either at ISI or some, any, some other place. So we were talking, uh, Ramesh was talking so far about Finite numbers, right? One, two, three, four. So now I want to make a leap and go to infinity. So if, instead of considering numbers one by one, let's consider all the numbers together, right? One, two, three, four, five, five, dot, dot, dot. That kind of goes on forever. You never reach the end. So that's the concept I want to talk about. Okay, before, before showing this film, what the film is about is, suppose you have a hotel in Bangalore, right? It has, it has 100 rooms. And suppose all the 100 rooms are occupied. Now, if a 101st chap comes along, comes along, he's desperate, he's kind of, it's a late night in Bangalore, he wants to find a room, the hotel, unfortunately, is gonna to have to tell him to go away. There's no room for him, right? You can't squeeze in a 101st person in a hotel which is already full, a 100-room hotel which is already full. But if the hotel had an infinite number of rooms, what would happen? That is this, that's what the film is about. 60-second adventures in thought. Number four. Hilbert's Infinite Hotel. A grand hotel with an infinite number of rooms and an infinite number of guests in those rooms. 
That was the idea of German mathematician David Hilbert, friend of Albert Einstein and enemy of chambermaids the world over. To challenge our ideas about infinity, he asked what happens if someone new comes along looking for a place to stay. Hilbert's answer is to make each guest shift along one room. The guest in room one moves to room two and so on, so the new guest would have a space in room one and the guest book would have an infinite number of complaints. But what about when a coach containing an infinite number of new guests pulls up? Surely he can't accommodate all of them. Hilbert frees up an infinite number of rooms by asking the guests to move to the room number which is double their current one, leaving the infinitely many odd numbers free. Easy for the guest in room one, not so easy for the man in room 8,600,597. Hilbert's paradox has fascinated mathematicians, physicists and philosophers, even theologians. And they all agree you should get down early for breakfast. Yeah, so what was the idea? So if you have an infinite, if you have a finite number of a Bangalore hotel with 100 rooms, if 101st person comes, he cannot be accommodated, right? So, but suppose you are kind of just as a kind of piece of poetic imagination, imagine a room, it cannot happen in reality, but imagine a, room, uh, imagine a hotel with infinite number of rooms, right? So they don't just end at 100, but they keep on. 101, 102, million and one, million and two. And suppose all of these rooms now, this hotel was filled up with people. And it comes along an, a, another person, right? Late at midnight, so desperately searching for a room. What will happen? So the, what, what, the, what Hilbert, this great uh, sort of German mathematician of the 19th and 20th century said, was that if you have an infinite number of rooms, you can always, and even if they are all full, you can always accommodate an extra person. And what is the scheme? What is the kind of scheme which will allow you to do that? Every room, every person just moves to the next room. Right? So now the person in room number one moves to room number two. The person in room number two moves to room number three. And, and so on and so forth. Right? But, the, but and the, 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 why, will, why will it work? Because given any room, there's always a room after that. Unlike a finite real world hotel. Right? In an infinite mathematically kind of uh, imagined hotel. There's always one more room to move to. So after you've done this procedure, room number one is open, right? It's free, vacant. So the person who's coming, the new person entering, can be accommodated in room one. Right? So this is, the, this is what the film talks about. Any questions about the film? Is it, does it make sense? Okay, so this is the kind of thing I want to talk about. Uh, infinite, uh, sort of the puzzling aspects when you think about infinity. So just, rather than just numbers, one, two, three, four, you can think about all the numbers together. And then there are an infinite number of them. So this is what my presentation is about. So there's one thing we know for, from uh, nursery school when I was in Cambridge, uh, the number theorists who taught us uh, used to say that whatever he was going to do is, was, is something we should have known in nursery school. It's because it's all about numbers which we know from nursery school. So we all know numbers, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, and there are infinite number of them. So this, as Ramesh has explained, they form the set of all natural numbers, which we denote by this fancy letter, script n. Okay, so after the integers, you can enlarge your system of numbers. You can add zero, right? Uh, and then you can also add the negative numbers. So you not only get zero, one, two, three. Maybe there's a minus sign missing there. Minus, you get minus one, minus two, minus three. So you have numbers stretching off to infinity in both directions. Okay, so so far so good. This is kind of numbers we uh, know. And then the kind of, uh, these the number theorists are very fond of these numbers. And the German mathematician and number theorist Kronecker in the 19th century was so moved by the beauty of these numbers that he said, God made the integers, all else is the work of man. Right? And as we'll see, I mean, there was a context in which he made this statement. We'll come to that context. Okay, next comes the rational numbers. Right? So where the numbers are, integers are fine when you, when you want to add and subtract, but when you want to divide, somehow you get into trouble. You cannot divide two by three in, and still stay in the realm of integers. When you divide two by three, you get a fraction. Right? So natu ras rational numbers are simply the fractions, one, nat one natural number upon another. One integer upon another as long as you don't divide by zero. Right? So you, we all know rational numbers also. Right? So there are lots of rational numbers and they also are infinite. But now one of the, one of the kind of, okay, so there are there's these various kinds of infinite sets, integers, natural numbers, rational numbers. So what, what I want to discuss is how, are, are, these num are these infinite sets roughly of the same size or are, there, are they of different sizes or can you have larger sets which have much bigger size than any of these? Right, so now, okay, so, now, rational numbers are good when you want to divide, right? But they do not serve all purposes. So can, you, can someone come up with a context in which you cannot, where, where, you, where you sort of feel that rational numbers are not enough for you, right? When, 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 do, when, do, when do you run out of, uh, when, when are rational numbers not enough for you? Any, any, any guesses? Sorry? Yeah, good idea. So, so x squared plus one, x squared plus one can never be zero with x rational number, right? 
So that's a very good answer. But in fact, okay, so let me think of, that makes you sort of invent a different kind of number which are complex. But let me think of something related. So it came as a great shock to Pythagoras that they could be, so many years ago, again, I haven't looked at my history, so 2,000 years ago, let's say, uh, that there could be numbers that were not rational, right? So somehow, I mean, it came as a great shock to this mathematician come philosopher Pythagoras, of the Pythag of famous for, amongst other things, the Pythagoras theorem, right? If you have a right angle, triangle, with size A, B, C, then A squared plus B squared equal to C squared. So, it, so uh, he was uh, shocked when he, and it kind of upset him a, a great deal because he had a, an elaborate theory built upon the fact that somehow they shouldn't be rational, irrational numbers, not numbers which are not rational. So can you think of one as someone just thought of one, right? When you think of X squared plus one equal to zero, suppose you assume it had a solution, that solution cannot be rational because the square of a rational number, or the square, the square of a rational number cannot be minus one, right? The square of a rational number is always either zero or positive. Okay, so let me, let me think of yet, yet another number, which is try to find the square root of two, right? Suppose you try to find a number x, so that x squared is equal to two. We all know that somehow that number exists, right? Well, what is, what is, you can write it in decimal expansion. What is that number? 1.4142 dot, 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 right? So it, there, there is some number which kind of pretends to be square root of two, but that number cannot be a rational number. And why is that? I mean, you can try rational numbers, and you, at the end of the day, you'll see that no rational somehow seems to exactly satisfy the equation, x squared equal to two. You can get rational numbers x, whose square comes very close to being two without quite being two, right? So you can kind of approximate uh, the solution of this equation using rational numbers, but never quite get there. So in fact, a, you can prove a theorem that there is no solution in rational numbers to x squared equal to two, right? So you can kind of actually prove, you can first experiment a bit, and then when you're convinced that somehow there is no rational number, you can try and actually prove it, because just trial and error will not, be able, will not allow you to prove that there is no rational number with this property. Okay, so what is the proof? So the proof is by contradiction, right? This is the, what Hardy calls the mathematical equivalent of in a chess kind of offering a piece as a sacrifice. So you offer a piece as a sacrifice to gain a, get a better gain, right? So this is the kind of the mathematical equivalent of sacrificing your knight or something when you're playing chess. Okay, so, so assume there is one. So assume that you, ha you have a rational number P upon Q whose square is equal to two, right? And as you, once you write a rational number as a quotient of two things, you can assume that not both are even, right? Because if both were even, you could cancel off factors of two. So you can kind of arrange things so that not both P and Q are even. Because if they were even, you could cancel off some common factors of two, right? So you, because you can write two upon four as one upon two, right? If you're given six upon 12, you might as well write it as one by two. Yeah, you can ca cancel common factors of two. So you can assume that at least one of them is odd. Okay. But now we just follow our logic, so we, we assume that x squared is equal to two, so p squared is equal to two q squared, or p squared upon q squared is equal to two. So p squared is equal to two times q squared. Now what does that tell you about p? Right, so p squared is two times something. So p is a, p squared is an even number, and hence p is an even number. Right, what we deduce from this is that p is an even number, and hence p is even, right? So it's twice some integer. Right, everyone agreed? We are, we are just following the logic of the equation. But then, then, we, what, then what do we get? Then we just look, look at what we get, then two Q squared, P squared is equal to two Q squared, but P is equal to twice M. So you get two Q squared is equal to four times M squared. Right, and then you cancel the common factor of two, you get Q squared is again an even number. Right, therefore you get Q is an even number. And why is that bad? Because we started with the assumption that not both P and Q were even. Right, we could always make arrange so that not both P and Q are even. But on the other hand, we are getting into a soup because when we follow the logic of the square of that number being two, we get that both P and Q are even. Right? So that's a contradiction. Right? So that's how you somehow prove that there is no rational number whose square is two. Right? You, ass you assume there is, and then you get yourself into trouble by this argument, by following the, just the pure logic of the situation. Just square both sides, say that P, P squared is even, hence P is even, and that forces Q to be even. Right? So is that kind of, Maybe after you go home, you can kind of think more about this uh, or try to reprove it for yourself, right? The best way to understand an argument is to shut the book and redo the argument for yourself. So you can, this is just a hint for the solution. Okay, so now, we've, therefore, when we, when we want to solve some very simple equations like x squared equal to two, you discover that the rational numbers are inadequate to solve that. Okay, so therefore you march on and then you 
sort of you, you look at uh, so if you consider if you consider the number line right we are familiar with the number line from school you have a number line with 0 1 2 3 minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 and there are various fractions like 355 upon 113 or there are lots of fractions but if you just think of rational numbers which are dotting this real number line there are lots of holes in it right for example root 2 we just discovered that square root of 2 is a number which is somewhere on this real line but it is not a rational number right so rational so the real numbers seem to be all of you have studied the number line, right, and real numbers and so on. So the real, num the rational numbers are, though they seem to be everywhere dense, in the sense they're really all over the place, they still, still do not account for all the numbers. Right, so for example, if you look at uh, square root of 2, you can get lots of rational numbers which come very close to being square root of 2, 1.4, 1.41, 1.414, 1 etc., etc., which come very close to square root of 2 without quite equaling root 2. Right? So, so therefore, if you imagine this number line, there, there are the integers, there are the natural numbers, there are the rational numbers, but they are not all of them. The totality of them is called the real numbers. And somehow the topic, some of the theme of this talk is that there are many, many more real numbers than there are irrational numbers, than there are rational numbers. The integers are very few, and the rational numbers are very few compared to the set of all real numbers. Okay, so we get the real line, real line by just not, not, not just looking at the real, rational numbers, but by the, at, at all numbers, right? On the, real, on the real number line. So okay, the pr process of filling in the holes is called by the technical word completion. So you're kind of completing the rational numbers to get this continuous smooth looking real line. So with just the rational numbers, uh, the real line is like a potholed uh, kind of uh, surface roads in Mumbai maybe after the rains. Right? So it's kind of, you, if you drive your car on this uh, real number line, just on this number line just made with the rational numbers, your car will really have a bumpy ride. But uh, when you consider, when you add all the real numbers, which all the missing kind of things, you get something which is really nice and smooth, and you can enjoy your real number line car ride. Okay. So, okay, so I'm doing this somewhat informally. Of course, there's a kind of mathematical theory which puts all the construction of real numbers on a solid footing, and that is called the theory of Dedekind cuts. Okay, so now, uh, why, why did Kronecker say that God, the integers, God made the integers and the rest is the work of man? Because he was very unsettled in some sense by the construction of real numbers. Because what he thought was that the rational numbers and the integers and so on, they're very tangible objects, some things which you can kind of get hold of. Well, a real number for some of was kind of for him a rather kind of fuzzy concept, which he, a, a, gen, a general real number is something which no one, can, in some sense, one, does, one cannot understand with the same concrete way as you can understand a rational number. Right, any questions so far? So I've just started with the rationals, I've kind of filled them up, I've talked to looking at the set of all real numbers. Okay, so we are, in some sense, of course, we know what a real number is, right? What is a real number? It's just some number you can write down in decimal expansion, right? You can write down 2.718281828, you can just write down reams of numbers, and that's a rational number, that's a real number. So we can write, we can know what a real number is, it's just a decimal expansion in a certain sense. We just, sorry, we just need, need to write it down in decimal notation. And the rational numbers will be those which typically just have a finite decimal expansion, like 2.12 or something. Or they could be a recurring decimal expansion, like 0 0.123, 0 0.123, recurring, right? So the rational numbers will be marked out among the set of, uh, rational numbers will be marked out among the set of all real numbers by having recurring decimal expansions. So in that sense, we know what real numbers are. They're just decimal expansions. But okay, but, the, but somehow, I mean, uh, for Kronecker, looking at real numbers and somehow, so, 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 real numbers were somehow a fall from grace, it was lapsing from the perfection which the rational numbers attained to. So they are un unsettling objects when, you, when we start to think of them more carefully. So if, when we start to think of real numbers more carefully, we come up with lots of kind of somewhat unsettling kind of paradoxical situations. So kind of, so, and, and that is why probably Kronecker felt they were, the real numbers were the creation of the devil, right? I mean, this was in the context of some argument he was having with another German mathematician, Cantor, who kind of gave the notion of the real numbers having a size which is uh, larger than the size of the real rational numbers. So he was having an argument with him and he used to use these kind of uh, somewhat metaphysical, kind of somewhat kind of charged terms. Okay, so, uh, so as, I, as I already said this, that the real numbers are in some sense less to a, less, not, not very concrete. And one of, the, one of the ways you can sort of say that they are not very concrete is that because there are far too many of them. The rational numbers somehow you can get hold of, but the real numbers, there are far too many of them. So I, I, one has to quantify the sense in which there are many, many more real numbers than there are rational numbers, right? Somehow this is kind of the main 
focus of my talk to say that there are many, many more numbers which are not rational than rational. How do you make precise this notion? Right? Because both sets are in some sense are infinite. There are infinitely many non-rational numbers, there are infinitely many rational numbers. So if you're given two infinite sets, how do you weigh them on a scale to say that one is more numerous than the other? One is kind of, that's a, one set is larger than the other. So that's kind of a, what I want to sort of uh, mainly bring out in this talk. How do you compare two sets uh, which are both infinite and be able to say that one is more infinite than the other, one is larger than the other? Right? So this is kind of a, a surprising theory which a German mathematician, Cantor, came up with in the 19th century. So this is the discovery that Cantor made in the 19th century when he made precise the idea of there being many, many more real numbers which were not rational than there were rational numbers. One of the things about uh, irrational numbers compared to rational numbers is there's no kind of way of finite way of storing their decimal expansion. If you want to store the decimal expansion of root 2 in your computer, you cannot do that, right? Because 1.4142, you'll have to store infinitely many digits because whenever you cut off the decimal expansion of root 2 with, and use, they just use that as a decimal expansion, it doesn't quite capture root 2. So in some sense, they're not very, they're not as, well, well rational numbers you can just store as p upon q you can, without consuming too many bits of the computer, mainly. Right, but okay, but, uh, okay, in the interest of time, I'm not, going to, uh, I'm not going to think of these other things which are called algebraic numbers. Let me just skip this. Okay, so now I just want to sort of, uh, I, want to, uh, I want to emphasize this fact that the rational, irrational numbers are much more numerous than the rational numbers. So it was the German, so Cantor made the precise discovery that there were many, many more irrational numbers than there were rational numbers. Right, so I'm, I'm skipping this because I'm in the interest of time. Okay, so instead of saying trans, I'm not defining this term transcendental, but Cantor's discovery that there were many, many more ir irrational numbers than rational numbers. So, okay, so we have kind of a hierarchy of numbers. First, we have the in natural numbers, then we have the integers, we have the rational numbers, then I'm going to drop this script A because I've not talked about them. And then you have the real numbers, right? And then you have something else called the complex numbers, which some of you might know of. So I want to examine how, how numerous these sets are, right? What are their sizes? So all, the, all of these sets are infinite. The natural numbers are infinitely many of them. The integers are infinitely many of them. The rationals are infinitely many of them. The real numbers are infinitely many of them. But I want to compare the sizes, right? So somehow that's what I'm constantly kind of... So we want to ask how, these, how large these sets are in relation to each other. As I said, I've skipped some slides, so I'm not talking about A and C, especially A. I'm just talking about the natural numbers, the integers, the rational numbers, and the real numbers. Okay, so this is the picture of Cantor who, who made this kind of, who made this kind of very radical discovery at that time that you can talk about sizes of infinities. There's, there's, there's not just one universal size which fits all infinite sets, right? They're kind of gradations of infinity. There are various kinds of infinity. And uh, so he made this discovery. So this is his full name, a very long name. Uh, was a German mathematician best known as the inventor of set theory and this kind of stuff about counting infinite sets, which has become a fundamental theory in mathematics. His theory of infinite sets of various sizes was very controversial when it was first invented. Right? And people accused him of all kinds of charlat charlatanism and kind of doing all kinds of... And it was even considered shocking that it encountered resistance from mathematical contemporaries, very, very, very distinguished mathematicians. And uh, some people called him, called his ideas as a grave disease infected with the, infecting the discipline of mathematics. Right? This is the price you pay for genius. In some sense, if you have ideas which are ahead of your time, right? the people who do not understand those ideas, at least when they're first proposed, they kind of criticize you and kind of give you a tough time generally in life. So you, sometimes if you're very clever, sometimes it may, you may not have a, such an easy life, right? Because some of you are having ideas which other people do not understand, and then you, they kind of criticize you or they don't agree with you. And uh, so, in fact, the, the attacks on Cantor kind of did kind of have a great, he paid a heavy price in terms of kind of, he was kind of a tortured person. Uh, so he was called a scientific charlatan, a corrupter of the youth, right? Because he was introducing all these new ideas which people thought would spoil the minds of young people. Anyway, but all this has been kind of a history has completely justified Cantor's ideas. His ideas have come, come to be kind of part of the mainstream of mathematics. And it has been suggested, uh, okay, Cantor thought that some of it, that Cantor believed his theory of trans, his infinite numbers had been communicated to him by God. Anyway. So David Hilbert de defended him, defended his theory, Cantor's theory from its critics by famously declaring, no one shall expel, expel us from the paradise that Cantor has created. Right? And Cantor's theory now occupies the very sort of, it's kind of one of the basic, one of the basic things in mathematics which is taught at a, in the, one of the undergraduate courses.
one of the first undergraduate courses. Okay, so now, okay, so now besides all this preamble about Cantor and his controversial theory, now let, let me tell you what his theory actually was, right? So the, his theory basically was to compare sizes of different kinds of infinite sets. So to say that there are various kinds of infinity. There's not just one, one infinity, but there are various kinds of infinity. Right, so for that we have to make precise our notion of when do two sets have the same size. Right? We have, when do we say, for example, if you have a shepherd and he's counting his sheep, and there are eight sheep who go out in the morning to graze. And when they come back, right? How does, he, how, does he, how does he know that they're eight? Suppose he didn't know the concept of number eight. What he'll do is, he'll have stones, eight stones, right? As many stones as they were sheep, right? He'll, he'll kind of sort of say that there were as many stones as they were sheep when, he, when they left in the morning. And to know that they were, the eight sheep have actually come back, he'll just see that whether, when, after the sheep come back, whether you can match every sheep to a stone, right? If, if, the, if the stones are more than the, if you cannot match this, then he'll, he'll discover that the, there were, there were one or two sheep went missing. Of course, he won't do this with eight, but maybe 200 or something, right? So, kind of, so the way he counts sheep is by matching the, the number of the, so matching the set of all sheep with some other set which he kind of has control on, which is a set of stones, right? So this is basically, this is a very intuitive idea which Cantor made precise, and that is, that, that is the, basically the idea of comparing sizes of two sets. You, two sets, okay, so two sets are uh, Set to be, so you, uh, this is, I'm just giving you the formal definition of a set. A set is just a set collection of objects. For example, the set of students in this room, that's a set. And in mathematical notation, you put it between curly brackets. Okay, and then you can, you, you, as you all know, you can consider maps between sets, right? That's just a rule. So a map between a set A and a set B is a rule which assigns to every element of A an element of B, right? So it's kind of just a bridge between A and B. It sends over which elements of A travel across to elements of B. Okay, so this, is, uh, so this is a map between sets. And then we, uh, we say a map is one to one. Right now we, have to, we want to give various adjectives to various kinds of maps between sets. So we say a map is one to one if no two elements of the set are taken to the same thing, if there's no collapse, right? If no, uh, so you can, for example, if I, assign to, if, I, if I assign to students their gender, whether they're male to female, male or female, right? So I'm defining a map between the set of students and the set of two elements consisting of male and female. Right now, is this set map one to one? As long as there are more than two girls in the audience, right, the two girls will be going to the same label, which is just me female, right? So this map is not one-to-one, -one, but if I assign every, uh, every to, to every student the exact address he lives in, he lives in, I don't, I don't, Kora Mangalam, something, anyway, whatever, the exact building, that, that'll be, that'll be a one-to-one -one map between the set of students and the set of addresses, right? Because no two, hopefully, I mean, unless they're siblings in the audience, staying in the same house. But typically this map will be one to one. Okay, so this is a one to one map. No two elements go to the same thing. And then uh, that such a map is called one to one or injective. Okay, it's, it's like an injection. And then it's surjective if, if you have a map which hits every element of the target, right? If your map from F from A to B is said to be surjective, if every element of B is, is hit by an element of A under this, under this rule F, right? So a map is a rule, and so, okay, I just have these two adjectives for, for maps. They are injective or surjective, right? Injective means no two things go to the same thing. Surjective means everything is hit by, by this map. So there's a, that's the formal definition. And something is bijective if it is both the properties. Right, so, so a map between two sets is bijective. Basically, if there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two elements, between the two sets. Every element of the beginning set, of the starting set, A, is matched, matched, matched to a unique element of B, right? And every element of B arises this way. So there's kind of one-to-one cause. -one so pictorially, Okay, before that, pictorially, so this is a bijection, right? So you have sets X and Y consisting of numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, A, B, C, D. So you can define a map. It sends 1 to D, 2 to B, 3 to C, 4 to A. And this is a bijective map because it's assigning to every element of the set X a unique element of the set B, of the set Y. This is called X and Y. Okay, so that, that using this very sort of basic notion, it's not a very complicated notion. You're saying a set is, map is bijective if there's an exact comparison between the two elements of the set. You can match them up or line them up, right? So two sets are said to be of the same size, have the same cardinality, if you want a fancy word, if there's such a map which is bijective between them, right? If there's a map between the two sets which sets up a one-to-one -one surjective correspondence. Every, every element of A is matched with exactly one element of B, and vice versa, every element of B is matched with a unique element of A under this map, right? So, it's, that's, what, so that, that's what Cantor made precise. He said that two sets... But now, now he kind of, uh, he, he took this mathematical leap of faith. He, he didn't just consider finite sets, but he considered two sets to be, have the same size if they can be matched one to one, right? If you can match every element of one set to, uh, to, a, to every element of the other set. Right, so, so but now, it's, 
So we, can, we use this notion not only for finite sets, but even for infinite sets. So a set is said to be infinite if it is not finite, right? I'm not going to kind of delve into this. this is what it's, if, it's, if, it's, if it cannot be put in bijection with kind of these finite sets of n elements. So we all know what an infinite set is. Now, infinite sets have the property that they have this paradoxical property that they have the same size as proper subsets of them, right? So if you have a finite set, if you delete one or two elements of them, you'll get a set of smaller size. But infinite sets have this kind of puzzling property that uh, you can have subsets of them, you can have kind of sub-collections of these sets, and both these sets have the same size under this definition. So now whenever we say two sets have the same size, the only, only way we can say that is to use our definition. Two sets are said to have the same size if there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between them, right? If every element of A is matched uniquely with a, every element of B, the A and B are the sets being considered. So why, 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 is, why are these two sets, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, why are, they, why, why, are they same, why are they the same size? That seems paradoxical because B is actually a subset of A. It is, it is missing many elements from A. It's missing 1, it's missing 3, it's missing 5, it's missing 7. It's missing all the odd numbers, right? But there's still a bijection. There's still a one-to-one -one correspondence which matches them up. And what is this map? Which is this, I want to produce a map F from a, which sends an element of A to an element of B. So I just double every element of A, right? I send n to 2, and I send 10 to 20, I send 13 to 26. But now you'll, you'll, it's a small exercise to see that this is indeed a bijection, right? It matches up the elements of A, the, all the integer, all the natural numbers with all the even numbers. So just n goes to 2n. That kind of matches up these two sets. Any questions so far? Is it clear what, what it means to have two sets of the same size? Okay, so under that definition, we get the somewhat surprising conclusion that you can have a sub proper subset, a set with some elements missing, but which still has the same size. So infinite sets behave kind of in a somewhat paradoxical way compared to our intuitions about finite sets. And now some of the smallest infinite set is the set of natural numbers, right? Because if you're given an infinite set, that means when you, ma when you, can count, when you keep on counting, you'll get more and more. Right? If you can kind of think about this, this means that you can always produce a map from the set of natural numbers to an infinite set, and that map takes no two numbers to the same element. Right? You can kind of count off elements of an infinite set and uh, never exhaust them. So you can get an injection, a one-to-one -one map from the set of natural numbers to the set of to, to the set. Right? Because that's what it means to be infinite. Okay, so now, now Cantor made this definition that a set is said to be countable if it can be, if it has the same set, if it, if it has the same size as a set of natural numbers. Right, so kind of he gave this notion of there being a, you, can, you, you say on the, the smallest kind of infinity, the smallest set which is still infinite is a set of countable cardinality. So you can count it, you can match it with the natural numbers. Okay, so but now you'll think, okay, but that's all. I mean, there, 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 maybe there are no more sets which are more numerous than the natural numbers, right? So this is the radical discovery he made that actually that there were sets which were more, which were, which had, uh, which had uh, sort of, which were larger than the set of natural numbers. They, they, they were more infinite. Okay, so in fact, I'm going to skip this slide now. Okay, so for example, he proved the astonishing, okay, so first, first of all, he proved a number of results which very unsettled people at that time, right? I mean, for example, if you look at the plane, if you look at the, maybe I should, I could draw there, but uh, so you, look at, you look at the plane, right? You look at R squared. Is there, is there a marker? This is, may, may, may not be visible to everyone, but okay. So suppose you look at the real, the plane, right? If you look at the X and Y axis and plot all the points in this plane, right? The, the real number line is sitting somewhere here. And while you have this entire plane. So it clearly seems that you have many, many more points in the real plane than the points on the real number line. Right? But on the other hand, Cantor proved this is a somewhat astonishing result that actually, under his notion of two sets being of the same size, the real numbers, which are the real, the real plane, so this, this, this set of totality of all points is denoted by R squared, and thus the real number line is denoted by R. So Cantor proved this kind of astonishing result, which kind of people were really angry about in terms of because it kind of did not fit in with the intuition that the number of points in R2 is the same as the number of points in R. Right? So what do you have to do to prove, to prove that by Cantor's definition? You have to define, you have to set up a one-to-one -one correspondence between a point in the plane and a point on the line. Right? So somehow you have to define some kind of funny map. Okay, and then for example, I mean, uh, I'll again, again leave you to flesh this idea out that you can in fact define, a, def define this kind of map. I'll tell you about the, way, the basic idea how to do this map. You can just shuffle the decimal expansion. Suppose you have, what is a, what is a, num what is a point in the, if you, have, if you have a point in the real plane, it'll have some decimal expansion, 0.A1, A2, etc. 
and it will have 0 0.B1, B2, right? And from, from that, you want to produce another real number. You want to produce a real number. So you kind of, this bijection you define, you, as to asso to, you associate to this number, the, the number you get by shuffling together the decimal expansions of these two coordinates. So you write 0 0.A1, B1, this is probably not going to be visible, but I'm talking about it, okay? 0 0.A1, B1, A2, B2, right? You shuffle the decimal expansions, as I say, as I say there. And this is the, basically the idea of the map. I'm not going to keep giving you all details. So th if you kind of think about this map more carefully, you can define a bijection. You can define a setup of one to one correspondence to a, every point in R2, uh, to every point in this plane, you can associate a unique number in the, on the real number line. Right? So this kind of uh, was a very surprising, unsettling discovery for people uh, because it's clearly, intuitively, it seems that there are many more real points on the plane than there are points on the real line. Right? But somehow, if, if you follow through with the logic of Cantor's definition, which is again a very intuitive definition of two sets having the same size, then you come up with this kind of somewhat unsettling fact that two, num two sets which seem, two sets, one of which seems far more numerous than the other, R2 seems much bigger than R, but still they have the same size. Okay, so for example, you also proved that one can set up a bijection between the natural numbers and the rational numbers, right? I IQ is a countable set. So for example, if you want to, if you want to say that the, how do you count off the rational numbers? So you can, you can count the rational numbers, right? Somehow the idea is that he, he discovered that you can count rational numbers and kind of set, set them up. You can count them one, two, three, four, and exhaust all of them, right? Here the idea is just simply to count off all the rational numbers m upon n, right? And bound the size of their numerator and denominator. There'll be only finitely many of them. There are only finitely many rational numbers with bounded size of numerator and denominator, and then you can count them off. And then just increase the size of the number you're bounding the size of the numerator and denominators off by. Right? So somehow, I mean, the picture here would be, you can imagine in some sense, you can imagine the rational numbers somehow is just basically a, a rough appro approximation. The rational numbers are just pairs of numbers m and n, right? m upon n. I can think of them as m n. Then you can count all the rational numbers by just going in this kind of, this kind of circular, serpentine pattern. I can just kind, kind of count off all the rational numbers by going, by tracing of larger and larger squares, right? And, and these are all lattice points. These are all, these all m1, n1, m1, n2. So you can just trace your, tra tra you can just go through all the points of the form m, n. You can just kind of draw this and then you can just call this one, two, three, four, five, six, right? And therefore you can count off all the rational numbers. Though they seem more numerous than the natural numbers, they are of the same size, right? So if you follow through with the logic of Cantor's definition, the natural numbers and the rational numbers, they both have the same size. Okay, so this, this again is a somewhat surprising result because rational numbers seem to be more numerous than, than, the, rash, than, the, than the integers. Okay, so now again I'm not talking about this thing. So now the, one of the most surprising, one of, the, one, of, one of his most beautiful arguments was to show that in fact, okay, so one would think that maybe, okay, the rational numbers have the same size as the set of natural numbers, maybe that's it. There are no more sets which are more, there are no sets which are more numerous than the natural numbers. But he proved that if you look at the real numbers, then they are much, they are, they are of a far, far greater size than the set of natural numbers, right? So he wanted to show that if you look at the set of all real numbers, you cannot count them off. Any, any time you try to count the real numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, you'll, you'll certainly end up missing lots and lots of real numbers, right? So and how, how do you make precise this argument? So he came up with an extremely beautiful argument for that, which is called Cantor's diagonalization argument. Okay, so he proved that the real numbers cannot be counted off. But I mean, somehow this seems intuitively clear because I mean, the real numbers are very kind of all over the place on the real number line. On the other hand, you have to take caution because even the rational numbers seem to be much more numerous than the natural numbers, right? They're all over the place on the real number line. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I am Sovan Das from National Public School, Kormangla. The size of na uh, national numbers and the size of uh, natural numbers are yeah. same, correct? Size of rational numbers and natural numbers, yeah. 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 So that means both the uh, number of uh, elements in their sets are equal. I mean, both are infinite, so talking about infinite equal to infinite, one has to, be one has to make precise what it means to be of the same size. One has to use Cantor's definition. Two hmm. sets are of the same size if they are in one-to-one -one correspondence with each. Every element can be matched off with a unique element of one set can be matched off with a unique element of the other set. Yeah, but if we do by layman's method, so you see that obviously a natural, uh, a rational number, there are more numbers, right? So take a set from one to 10. Okay, yeah. there are only 10 natural numbers in that set. 
but you can can infinitely many rational numbers between 1 to 10. No, but that's not the way you count them. The way, for example, if you follow through how I'm counting the rational numbers on this grid, I'm not, I'm, when I'm, I'm not going to count, I'm counting them from 1 to 10, I'm not going to enumerate yeah, that's all. that's a layman language, I said, from yeah. 1 to 10 only. Huh. But suppose... Uh -huh. No, but one has to just follow through with the definition. In mathematics, I mean, sometimes your intuition can lead you astray. You have to just follow through with the logic of the definition. The definition says two sets are infinite, are equally numerous or have the same cardinality. If, they can be, if there's a one-to-one -one map between them, if you can match off the elements of the set, the pair of the elements. But, so, yeah, so it, uh, maybe, maybe you can talk about it later. Okay, okay. thank you. All right, so, but okay, now I'm going to end with this. So, one, so this is kind of one of the punchlines of Cantor's uh, theory that, okay, you can as as ascribe the notion of there being a, two sets being of the same size, and then you have these kind of infinite sets with the natural numbers, the rational numbers, and now when you look at the real numbers, you get many, that, that's, that set is much, much bigger than the set of natural numbers in the sense, in the, in the sense of Cantor's definition. You cannot, you cannot uh, count all the real numbers using the natural numbers, right? You cannot count them one, two, three, four. Okay, so what is the argument for that? So the argument is again by this ga mathematical gambit of contradiction. You assume that suppose, suppose it's false and then you see that you get into trouble, right? So suppose you could count them. Suppose you could enumerate all the numbers in the interval 0, 1, all the numbers between 0 and 1. Right? All the numbers between 0 and 1 will have some decimal expansion, 0 0.1828, whatever, right? So suppose, you, so suppose you could enumerate them. So you could write down a list. Suppose you could exhaustively list all the real numbers between 0 and 1 in their decimal expansion as in their decimal expansion as point A1. So this is, the first number is point A11, A12, A13. The second number is A21, A22, A23, etc. Suppose you could list, list all these numbers, right? So now we want to get a contradiction. So what we want to do is, suppose you, suppose you have a scheme for counting all the real numbers one by one. What we have to show is that some real number is going to be missed in this list. Right? Some of that, is the, that, that has to be the punchline of the argument that the reason why this work cannot work is because there's a real number which has not been counted in the scheme. Right, so, how you, so suppose you have an enumeration of all the real numbers between 0 and 1. How do you come up with a, with a, with a number in this interval which is missed in this enumeration? Right, so this, there, there was this brilliant idea of Cantor, which is kind of what you do is you go along the diagonal of this, of this enumeration. So you look at, so you, you, you consider a number whose decimal expansion is that the first digit does not agree with the first decimal expansion of the first number in this list. The second digit, B2, does not agree with A22. Okay, so let me write. This. So how did Cantor make the idea? Uh, how did Cantor prove that the set of real numbers cannot be counted off on your using the natural numbers? So suppose suppose you could write count write, suppose you could write down all the real numbers between zero and one. So okay, so you would have some decimal expansion. Then you'll have zero point. So this is the these are, this is the first line. This is the first number. So it's all the ones are in the first coordinate. And this, okay. Let's suppose you have the second number in this enumeration. And then third number, etc. Right, so this is a very beautiful argument to think about when we, when you go home to see if you can really understand it. Because I'm, I'm going to explain the basic idea without giving you all the details. So suppose suppose you could enumerate all the real numbers, right? Which is which, which is just to say that you can write down a list which exhausts all the real numbers. So that's what it means to enumerate. That's what it means to set up a bijection between the real numbers and the natural numbers. You can just list them like this. So you want to come up then with a number which is not in this list and which is still a real number between 0 and 1. Right? So what do you do? You try, how do you come up with this number? So you write down a number such that its first decimal term expansion, first digit does not agree with A11. So you write down a number B1 so that B1, so on the margin of this thing, you write down B1 not equal to A11. On the, on the next thing, so how do you come up with the second, second uh, digit in this decimal expansion? You write down number, number B2 such that B2 is not equal to A22. Right, this is what I say there, but I'm just kind of giving details. Right, and so on and so forth. When you, when you, when you write, down, write down the nth digit of this number, you consult the nth enumerated number, and you make sure that Bn is not equal to Ann. Right, so this is called Cantor's diagonalization procedure, because what you're doing is you're enumerating all the real numbers, drawing a diagonal through them, at, at which Ann should be. And then you're coming up with a number such that it does not agree in its first decimal expansion with this number digit, it doesn't express on its second, with this second, uh, the second element of this diagonal, et cetera. And this number you'll have created, this number is, is, is which you'll get, which is again maybe an inf 
infinite decimal expansion, is miss, it will be missing on the list, it will be missing on the enumerated list. Right, so somehow when you, when you try to enumerate all the real numbers, you get into trouble because you, somehow you can prove that whenever you try to enumerate the real numbers, write them off one by one, there will always be a real number which has not been caught in your scheme of counting, right? scheme of listing the numbers. So this is kind of called Cantor's diagonalization argument. It was, from this we deduce that rational numbers, are, which, are, which we proved are countable, or at least I told you a rough idea of how to prove it, but the real numbers are uncountable. And our transcendental numbers I'm not, I'm not talking about. So the, real, the irrational numbers are many more, so they're uncountable. And we, so, okay, so this produces, for example, lots of irrational numbers without even having, having to produce one, right? You can just write down this, this is a kind of existence argument. So this was what Kronecker objected to this argument. It ex proves the existence of irrational numbers without even having produced any one, right? So it was kind of an existence proof. So this was one reason Kronecker found Cantor's ideas unsettling. They led to proof of existence of objects without giving any method to construct them. Right? So these are kind of these, then there was this long debate in mathematics which started from the, about the foundations of mathematics. Does, does that show, this, is there some logical kind of problem with the foundations of math? And so there was a heated debates, people calling each other names, which went on to, from, the, from the late 19th century to, to the, to the early, early 20th century. Right? Kronecker objected to the non-constructive nature of Kronecker's a proof of existence of irrational numbers, for example. I mean, we know two root two is irrational, but Kronecker tells you that there are lots and lots of irrational numbers sh pure, purely by saying that they exist, proving that they exist without being able to list one. I mean, the proof does not allow you to list one concretely. Okay, so maybe I'm gonna end here in the interest of time, I will take any. Uh, I'm Rohan from DPS Bangalore South. Um, what I understood was that uh, Infinity can be both uncountable infinities and countable infinities. Yeah. So if you have the set of complex numbers and the set of real numbers, then uh, both sets are uncountable. Yeah. So can, instead of comparing um, real numbers with natural numbers, if you compare real numbers with complex numbers, is the same thing valid? That complex numbers have more elements than real numbers in the set? No, but in fact, complex numbers and real numbers have the same size. You can define a bijection between them. You can set up a, okay. you can match them off one by one. Okay, so if they're both of the same type of... They're the same size as far as this definition goes of Cantor. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Because the complex numbers in some sense, the way you visualize them is on the plane. A plus IB, they're on the plane. It's, yeah. So this is uh, Cantor's proof that R2 and R, they have the same cardinality. They're the roughly of the same size. Uh, so you asked us, okay, I'm Jyotsna from DPS South. You asked a question at the beginning of the presentation. We got a solution set for it. Oh, that's very good. Uh, it goes like this. It's 131 into whole of 2 plus 11K plus 15, uh, which gives you the number where K is equal to the whole numbers. That's very good. It sounds correct. So, okay. So I should applaud it. <laughs> Maybe you can tell us, tell me your method later. So this, Sorry, this problem I did, I mean, I was, which, which I posed, you can do by the method of Euclidean algorithm. It's the method of long division, how you want to divide one number by the other. So it's, yeah, the proof is that, so it's very good. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ashwin from DPS South. Uh, I was wondering how exactly you go about proving the transcendentality of numbers. How do you prove that they are not solutions of any polynomial equation? Oh, yeah, that's very difficult, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you have to... Uh, so I, it's, I mean, it's much harder to prove that a given number is transcendental than proving that there are lots of them. So that was what Kronecker objected to Cantor's proof, that I mean, you could easily prove that there are lots of transcendental numbers, but if you're actually asked to hand it over a number and asked to prove it's transcendental, it's hard proof, yeah. I mean, it's difficult for me to explain in two minutes. And generation of transcendental numbers is also equally difficult? Yeah, I mean, to, to write down an explicitly transcendental. transcendental, but there'll be theorems which will tell you some criteria for when a number is transcendental. It's not difficult to write down some sort of transcendental numbers, but if you're given an actual concrete number like E or pi, to prove it's transcendental is very hard. Is hard. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm yeah. Ishan from NPSK. Um, for, in general, for an infinite set, is um, A, does A have the same cardinality as A cross A, or? Yeah, yeah, for yeah. A, A has the same cardinality as A cross A. In fact, amongst the slides, I was, so that's a good exercise to try and do. How, how do you, so as I said, R2 has the same size as R, and it gave some kind of proof. 
You can try and see how to generalize that scheme of proof to show, say that A cross, if A, and, if A is infinite, then A cross A is, has the same size as A in the sense of Cantor. You can set up a one-to-one -one bijection. I mean, you can match them off. Yeah. Uh, sir, I'm Ramya from National Center for Excellence. Yeah. I had a doubt regarding the video clip. Yeah. Uh, they said that uh, when the infinite a uh, person comes, then uh, the, each person should be sent to the next one. Yeah. So why not send the infinite person to the infinite room? No, because there's no such <laughs> there's no such thing as an infinite room. By infinitely many rooms, one just means that there are more and more rooms, but there is no room which will have the which will have the room number infinity on it, right? It's just that there are more and more rooms. So they can send him to the last room. It but there's no such thing as last. Yeah, that's kind of. But there's no such thing as a last room, right? Infinity somehow is a, there's a thing that it's not a it's not a number in the sense of there will be a room with a label infinity. It's infinite in the sense that no you're you're never at the end of the room. There's always a next one. So yeah, so yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a puzzling thing. I mean, even in school, I used to I once proved tried to prove to my friend that the number infinity existed by showing that in the logarithmic table infinity was written down. So I said here that's why the number exists, right? But infinity it doesn't have the same status as kind of other numbers, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's not a number in the usual sense. You can have the notion of two, a set being infinite, but you, there's no number called infinity. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm Akash from Presidency RT Nagar. Uh, you said there are uncountable, uncountable real numbers and natural numbers, right? No, natural numbers are countable. The real numbers uh, why are can't we create, Why can't we create a bijection between the real numbers and the natural numbers? That, that's, the, that's the proof, right? You can't create. That's a great insight of Cantor. That if you ever tried to create a bijection, you could always create a number which is off this bijection, off this, so by, by saying that the real numbers are countable, let's say between 0 and 1, that means you can list all the real numbers in a list, right? And that list will go on and go on and go on, and at the end, whenever you want a real number, it will be found somewhere down in the list, right? So you have to then, to, to say that this cannot happen, you have to be able to, given any list, you have to be able to create a number which is between 0 and 1, and which is off this list, right? So this is Cantor's brilliant idea, that the, given any list, you can always create a number which is off this list by going down the diagonal of this enumeration, looking at the first digit of the first number, second digit of the second number, et cetera, and just creating a, a brand new number which has the property that the first digit B1 is not equal to A11, B2 is not equal to A22, B3 is not equal to A33, right? And therefore this number which you will have created by this construction will have the property that does not agree with the first number because it, the first digit does not match. It does not agree with the second number because the second digit does not match. It does not agree, it's not equal to the third number because the third digit does not match. I mean, it takes some thought to kind of absorb this argument, but this is the idea of the argument. It's kind of a proof, it's a, it's a great argument, so it took, maybe it took Cantor quite a lot of thought to come up with this argument, right? That's the beauty of mathematics, that to come up with an argument sometimes takes a long time, but to understand it takes much shorter, but it still takes some time. So, so I mean, the, if you enumerate the numbers, you try to come up with a number which is off this list by this, what is called Cantor's diagonalization procedure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sixty-second adventures in thought. Number one, Achilles and the tortoise. How could a humble tortoise beat the legendary Greek hero Achilles in a race? The Greek philosopher Zeno liked a challenge and came up with this paradox. First, the tortoise is given a slight head start. Anyone fancying a flutter would still rush to put their money on Achilles, but Zeno pointed out that, to overtake him, Achilles would first have to cover the distance to the point where the tortoise began. In that time, the tortoise would have moved, so Achilles would have to cover that distance, giving the tortoise time to amble forwards a bit more. Logically, this would carry on forever. However small the gap between them, the tortoise would still be able to move forwards while Achilles was catching up, meaning that Achilles could never overtake. Taken to an extreme, this bizarre paradox suggests that all movement is impossible. But it did lead to the realization that something finite can be divided an infinite number of times. This concept of an infinite series is used in finance to work out mortgage payments, which is why they take an infinite amount of time to pay off. Yeah, one well, last question. Um, I don't, uh, I'm Kavya from Sushikriha. I didn't understand the last video clip you showed, the Achilles and the tortoise, oh, because okay. Maybe you know, I when you get a head start, you if the speed is higher, you can overtake, right? I didn't yeah. understand. Yeah, that that's true, of course. In real life, but the thing is, you're chopping up, you're chopping up time into smaller and smaller bits. But in real life, I mean, kind of, you're, you're, when you when one minute passes, certainly if, if okay. So the idea of the, the thing was that okay, in terms of maybe I can just play the clip again, but.
or maybe I'll just tell it to you on the board. The idea is that suppose this is Yes, again, all these are paradoxes in the sense they kind of a mind bender, so one has to just kind of ponder over them. So it's a good idea to ponder over them when you go away. But I mean, so the basic idea is here is, okay, I'm not very good at drawing, so I'm drawing, going to draw tortoise by like this, and Achilles by like this, okay? It doesn't look like much of a warrior, but anyway, maybe I can draw the Achilles heel here, okay? So, okay, so, here, so he starts off a race, so, so, he's, so suppose it's a 100 meter race, right? But because, because the tortoise is very slow, you can think of the hare and the tortoise. The, the tortoise is very slow, he, he's given some kind of, he's, he's, the, the, this guy is handicapped, so this, this guy is given a, let's say a 10 meter advantage to begin with. Okay? And so, and, and let's say, okay, this is, let's say this is actually 1,000 meters. Anyway. So, but the point is, okay, so, so one would think, but this guy is much faster, this guy, I, I'm not going to assign numbers, but maybe this guy is three times as fast as this guy, he's much faster. So one would think logically that in the end he's certainly going to overtake. The, tort the tortoise, right, if he's given enough time, and that, that there'll be enough time if the distance is long enough. But now the, the thing is, the, the, the way the film argues is that, okay, so he's, he's given a start of 10 meters, right? So now by the time Achilles, or the hare, comes to 10 meters, the, the tortoise is very slow, but he does move, right? So he'll have gone to maybe 10.2 meters, or whatever, I don't know, 10.2 meters, right? So by the time Achilles reaches 10, the, the tortoise would have crawled ahead very slowly to 10.2. But, but okay, so he's still ahead. But now when you, when, now when the Achilles reaches 10.2, the, the tortoise would have gone ahead some more, right? He would have gone by 10.2, 6 or something. Right? So, when, when he, so he, he can never quite catch up. Whenever he reaches where the, where, where the tortoise was, the tortoise is just a little bit ahead. Right? So if you argue like that, it seems that the Achilles, the, someone who's much faster than the tortoise will never be able to overtake the tortoise. But that's wrong, right? I mean, of course, logic. So but the thing is, we are splitting up, we are kind of dividing up time more and more and more, and that's not the way it will play out when you look at the entire race. Thank you. Yeah, that's the basic. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Kare. I'd just like to invite uh, Ms. Janaki Prasad from Shishukraha School to deliver the closing. Feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. Today, it's my privilege to give the, that present. Yes, I'm here for the word of thanks. On behalf of Sishigraha Modzudin High School, I would like to thank Professor Ramesh Srikantan for his wonderful talk on prime numbers. Yes, Euclid is even relevant in iPad era also, as the picture suggested. I was stunned by the way they came down to our level and explained so many difficult concepts. And I would also like to thank Professor Chandrasekhar Kari for his exciting talk on number theory. <laughs> Sir, today if someone mentions infinity, I'm sure some of our students will ask which one, is it countable or uncountable? I'm definitely sure at least one or two of us will definitely ask that question. I'll also wish to express my gratitude to Mr. Dinesh and Infosys Science Foundation for providing such an opportunity for us and the students of ba Bangalore. We have been fortunate to have been backed by the dedicated personnel of Infosys facilities team, the audiovisuals, recordings, and definitely for the lunch that we are going to have. They are all credited to this efficient team. Thank you, guys. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation to the teachers present here. Being one, I know how difficult it is to take off from our busy schedule to bring the students here in spite of this bad weather. Thank you, teachers. Finally, the students, you have been a great audience. Excellent response. This would not have been possible but for your enthusiastic participation. I hope all of us benefited some from it. And I can see, I hope we had more mathematicians in this audience. Again, one more request is keep in touch, schools. Send us your feedback on our Facebook and email IDs. We look forward to bringing you many more events. All the pictures of the previous event have been uploaded. You can take it down. Or if you want any specific pictures, you can always request us. Keep in touch again. That's all I can say. Jai Hind.